Welcome to Friday. And since it's Friday, we're in for some literature. However, this isn't ordinary literature. This is going to be from Rick Bragg. As most of you who are listeners already know, he is one of my favorites. And this happens to be the best cook in the world. Tales from my mama's southern table. And what I loved so much about this book, which I've read cover to cover, is that you don't just get the fixins or the procedures, you also get the stories behind it. And you may notice from uh, when you've uh, logged into our site that you saw two photographs left and right. If you look to the photograph to the left, there are three people in it. There's one man with a mustache. That's Jimmy Jim Bundrum. More about him later. Up top of him is this uh, picture of a woman. That's his wife, Maddie. She was kicked by a mule and sadly died much later. But right down below, there's a little whippersnapper. Now, he's a blonde boy, kind of looking off to the future. That's Rick Bragg's great granddaddy. Now, flip to the other side of the screen. I want you to look at that person who's standing right there looking right at you. Now, that happens to be uh, Ava. And I'll tell you, these stories are intertwined. Let me give you some background. Jimmy Jim Bundrum didn't talk much. He liked liquor, liked moonshine. And, you know, he had some trouble with the law. And the, the, the law was after him, so he hightailed it off into the, the woods, in the Georgia woods, and uh, left his family behind. Well, his young son, that was that little boy I pointed out to you, fell in love with this beautiful woman. Her name was Ava. And at a church uh, supper, he actually bid for the meal that she made. Ah, oh, it was melting your mouth, fried chicken. It was a slab of pie. It was pure heaven in a box. And let me tell you, he paid a dollar for that box. So he knew he had him a real good wife. Now, as far as being a real good wife, here's the rest of the story. Ava's sisters and her mother were so tired of that cross patch Ava, they wanted her out of this house so bad they could taste it. So uh, they got together, and each of the sisters and the mama cooked something wonderful to put in that box. Oh, well, poor Charlie ended up getting a box with a lot of goodies, but he didn't get the woman who made the goodies. So he was getting skinnier and skinnier, and he knew his daddy was a good cook, but he didn't know where his daddy was. He was up the hill somewhere. So he went after him, found him, got him, begged him to come back, and oh, please teach my wife Ava how to cook. She's, I'm, I'm dying. I'm, I'm skin and bones. You got to do something. So he took pity on his, his son, and he traveled behind him and went and lived with them to teach Ava how to cook. Notice, I haven't gotten to a recipe yet. It's going to be a while before I do, but this is one of the joys of this kind of cookbook. It takes you all sorts of places. Now come with me to 1924. It was bad enough she had to stand at that wood stove and listen to the old man preach on food as if he was John the Baptist of beans and grits and pigs and such. At least he kept his sermons short, plain, to the point. Hateful truth was it was beginning to sink in. She was beginning to appreciate the difference between food and good food. She did not appreciate her lessons enough to stop griping and stomping, but this was her natural state, in the way that uh, that grimness was his, and did not always mean a lot. 
But then, on top of everything else, he made her follow him into the weeds and the sad remnants of the fall garden, uh, where he preached on curtly about the change in season, you know, the position of the moon, early frost. She walked behind him like a petulant child, and even kicked the dirt every few steps. Old man turned and saw her standing in the middle of a rising cloud. Her socks, <laughs> she wore big, thick men's woolen socks with a high-ankled old-fashioned shoes, red with, with kicked-up dust. He just shook his head and pointed to the tumble-down shed that passed for their barn and the uh, mule stabled within. Working people he warned her, could not afford to remain ignorant of the sky, the rain, and the chemistry of the turned earth underneath. They could not ignore the frost and pests and blight, or fail to see the potential in a seed the size of a speck of dust that could save your life, if your luck was running high. The boy had learned how to grow a fine garden from his mama before she passed away, and before uh, that from the old man himself, before he vanished into exile. Most of the good things were gone, of course. You know, the tomatoes, the squash, the sweet corn, ah, the okra. A fall garden could still feed you a good while, though, and as he talked, he gathered a good mess of collards, Best green there is on earth, he believed. While he was there, he searched for and found the last of the hot pepper, the twisty little pod of turning cayenne. The collards were taller than his knees, and she had been gathering them a few at a time since they first started to come in. But the old man had ignored them till now. First frost had settled cold and silver on the garden just a day or so before. <laughs> They're ready now, he said. Now just because row of collards were tall, even as high as your hip bones, did not mean they were ready to eat, he believed. You can pick collards as soon as they start to come in. In late summer, early fall, as the weather begins to go cool, if they're all you have, he said. But though young, small collards were tender, they were a little bland. If you could wait a bit, he said, wait to pick them after the first light frost had touched them. The frost does something to collards that just makes them a little bit better. I think they're sweeter, he said. He tapped his temple again for emphasis. Remember. Just this. And a pan of good cornbread is pretty fine, he said. Is this all we're having? She asked. Not by damn sight, he said. He had a nice piece of hog jowl. Pound or so, slowly curing in the smokehouse. It had not cured much, but some smoke was better than none. He rubbed it all over with a little bacon grease and a heavy log and camp dose of coarsely ground black pepper. Set it aside. He needed an iron rack to slip inside the pot to raise the hog jowl an inch or so, as the fat rendered. Girl did not have one, so he went searching. He came back with three railroad spikes, the black iron, clean, not rusty. Boy picked them up in the rail yards, and when he walked the tracks, he, he used them as weights and in fish and turtle traps and more. Old man rubbed them clean, then rubbed them again with some uh, bacon grease and lined three of them across the pot to rest the pork on. He covered it with a heavy lid, slid it into the bacon box on the iron stove. Ava stood beside him, aghast, making a face. 
Who cooked with stuff that shook out of cross ties when the train roared by? Hog jowls is not as exotic as some folks think. You know, Granny in, in um, Heb Beverly Hillbillies introduced it to much of America in the 1960s. It is, though, exactly what the name implies. The fatty meat that the hog's jowl, the flavor to many, is like a cross between fat back and pork belly. Uh, it is an excellent seasoning in boiled beans, but it bakes to something close to heaven. The peats the old man used was mostly fat, but had a thin streak of lean, salted. The lean uh, could be a little strong, in this, as in most side meat, though it was excellent for seasoning, smoked or fresh, it, it, it was milder. There were people in the hills who believed all other parts of a hog were inferior to the jowl. And he, he was one of them. He had cooked them every way you could, even sizzling, dripping, skewered on a stick over a campfire. He had scored it with a knife, slow cooked it in an iron pot outdoors, surrounded by bubbling beans. But the best way, he told the girl, was to bake it slow in its own running fat. Maybe, you know, surrounded by some sweet potatoes, till all that was left was the crisp, crumbly ghost of what you started with. No one seems to recall the brand, but the wood stove <clears throat> in his daughter-in-law's kitchen was a good one, solid one, the child's only dowry. The old man had done most of his cooking in the fireplace itself, or in outdoor kitchens, but he liked this invention tremendously. Still, he would not give it his final seal of approval until he had tested it on some good hog jowl. That's all we do to the jowl, he told the girl, till we throw in the sweet taters. Now, let's get to the greens. He showed her how to wash them thoroughly, chop them up so that they'd cook down to pieces eat about the size of a playing card. Then he put them on to cook with salt, sugar, a single pod a hot pepper, and a small piece of fat. White meat, what he called fat fat, is better for collards or a nice little chunk of streak of lean. But anything will do. Why, it's smoked or fresh or salted, he said. But there was a science to it. You don't want no real whole lot of meat in your greens. You want your, your greens to be seasoned. But you don't want no big old hunk of seasoning meat. You don't want your greens to get greasy. And they'll get that way if you put in too much meat. Uh, he had heard of a Frenchman who seasoned greens with a piece of duck fat. Oh, no, that seemed a little fancy pants to Ava. The old man surprised her. I ain't had much duck, but that don't seem no bad idea at all. We shoot some ducks this winter. We'll see about that. Collards, like any greens, had to be smartly seasoned. If you used salt meat of any kind for your seasoning, you should reduce the salt you added, he lectured, or they would be inedible. Greens should taste mildly sweet and hard at the same time. The sugar, working in concert with the seasoning meat and salt, would reduce their natural bitterness. Why can't you just add more sugar to your greens? Instead of waiting for the frost, the girl asked him. 
You know, it was the first logical question she had asked since her lessons began. Take the same kind of sweet, the old man answered. As with the beans, the amount of water and its gradual addition to the pot was important. He showed her how to begin with just a few cups of water, just enough to cover. Slowly, add more as it cooked away. His own mama had taught him that, you know, to keep from washing the taste right out of the good stuff. If the pinto was the bean of kings, then the collard was their green. Even people who didn't like greens liked collards because the leaves were naturally dense, oh, not mushy or weedy. But he said the truth about cooking collard greens was that sometimes, no matter how good a cook a person was, the greens would still taste a little strong, the texture might be a little tough, even after two hours or more of cooking. There was some luck involved, the old man told her. There was luck involved in cooking just about anything on a wood stove. In a time when a spice rack often consisted a little more than a pepper pot, in a box of salt. Everyone knows about pot liquor. Even the girl knew about it, but he told her anyway. Now you save the juice in the pot's bottom to mix with your cornbread the next day. It's better than soup, especially if you got a few scraps of collards left. It was poor folks' version of the Italian wedding soup. Oh, and a fine meal in lean times. The old man called it broth. Well, he called every savory liquid that, whether it was from greens, beans, squash, well, or chicken. But if beans were the foundation of a poor man's diet, greens were his apothecary. The broth from the greens, fortified with pork, was also an excellent meal for the sick rich in iron, to get them out of bed and back in the mill or the field, back down the ladder up to the bottom of a well. No one, no one with cash money, the old man told his daughter-in-law, has got no use for helpless poor man. Greens is medicine. All greens is medicine. Beans will steady a body, but greens will cure one. But it ain't no reason it can't taste good, too. He finished the meal by peeling four sweetened sweet potatoes uh, and, without seasoning them at all, raising the lid of the iron pot and easing them in to cook as the hog jowl finished. Then, leaving the girl to watch the greens, he went out to have a smoke. She wandered out to the porch two or three times, but was ordered inside to supervise. Greens were done in two hours, roughly dense and leafy, mm -hmm. but tender. They were sweet and hot and savory, as the old man had predicted. Hog jowl crumbled to the touch, sweet potatoes had soaked in some of the flavor, and in turn it added just a little sweetness to the pork as their flavors swirled inside the pot. Boy was uh, getting used to being glad it was supper time. He started, the girl told him, <laughs> but I had to do most of it. Now, very briefly, I'm going to give you at least one recipe. It's for collard greens. Now, what you'll need, about two or three large bunches of collard greens, one small piece fat back of hog jowl, about two slices of bacon, one, one whole pot hot pepper, you know, such as cayenne, a small clove of garlic, a tablespoon of salt, and a tablespoon of sugar. Now, how to cook them. 
Wash the collards at least three times. Grits. Green clings to collards and the wrinkles at the edges of the leaves and in between the stalks. Chop the small stalks and leaves into pieces about the size of your hand. Wash them once more. Do not be alarmed if you have a monstrous pile of collards. They will cook down. Now, how much of the stalk you use? Oh, that, that's the thick main stalk closest to the cut. Well, it's a matter of taste. My mama uses most, most salt. So some cooks say that it will add a little flavor and a little texture to the finished dish. She thinks such people just don't know collards. Now you do not have to cover the collards with water. Just use two or three cups. Bring them to a boil in a large covered pot. Add the fat back of bacon if, if you use uh, bacon slices. You cut them into thirds and the whole pepper, the whole clove of garlic, and the seasonings. If you must, substitute for the pepper pod three good dashes of hot, clear pepper sauce. Hey, but no more than a good teaspoon. Reduce the heat to low, cover, cook for about two hours, adding water if necessary, if necessary, as it cooks out still being careful not to drown the leaves with too much water. Stir every 15 minutes at least. Now, some cooks like to use a set of tongs instead of a large spoon to move the collards around. There should be very, very little liquid left in the bottom of that pot when your collards are done, now Mama said. Time is of secondary importance, she stresses, as a measurement in the cooking of collards. Texture is paramount. Cook them until the leaves are tender, but not until they disintegrate. So you pay attention as they cook and take a leaf or two from the pot and test it after, oh, I don't know, about an hour and a half. You should be able to cut easily through the collards with the edge of a fork when they're done. Collards should be leafy and should seem, well, well, substantial, almost dense, and not be in shreds or ropes after they cook as other greens can be. Now, do you not confuse collards with turnip greens, spinach, or mustard greens, and you never mix them. Though it is acceptable for turnip greens and mustard greens to go mushy, mushy collards are terrible. You want really mushy collards? Open a can, my mother believes, and be sure to taste when you test them for texture. If they're too bland, you just add a little salt to the pot. You do not want overpowering heat in the dish, so be careful when choosing the fresh pepper. She likes can, but some people like jalapeno or, or even serrano. Good rule is to avoid anything bigger than your little finger. And I try not to break it as you stir in the collards. This is a fine point, but an important one. Never, ever slice or dice the pepper, or the garlic, for that matter, as it'll make those flavors overpowering. Dried pepper will suffice in this dish, but again, use a whole pod. But you can find hot peppers year-round now in the grocery stores. About the only great improvement my mother seems to admit to in the last 30 years. My mother grows her own and cut down milk jugs shaded by rock wall. Many people like me like sweet or collard greens. You can adjust the sweetness to taste. Again, try to season your collards as they cook, instead of just smothering them with extra pepper sauce on the table or in the serving bowl. It will greatly alter the flavor. Not the pepper so much as the strong pickling vinegar the peppers are preserved with. Sometimes to such a degree that you cannot even taste the savor greens. Stick to a clear hot pepper sauce if you want to slop 
a lot of red pepper sauce on your greens. She believes you should never be offered any good greens to begin with. I don't know why people feel like they gotta mess stuff up, she said. Unlike beans, which can be cooked to a more or less reliable formula unless they are old, collard greens can be a little more complicated, as Jimmy Jim Bundrum warned. Some collards will be tough when you pick them late in the season, but they'll have more flavor. Now, my mother, that's what my mother said. Sometimes collards can be bitter. I think it's because of the dirt they come from. Nowadays, you can get collard greens out of season in the grocery store, but I don't know about them collards. I don't know where they're from or who, who, who ever grew them or well, nothing. I like to eat my collards in season, took from my own dirt. But even odd collards is better than no collards, I, I suppose. The old ways are hard to discard. The secret to good collards is the old admonition to pick them or buy what you believe to be fresh-picked greens after the first frost, which might sound like folklore, but may have some scientific basis. It ain't no myth. It's nature. You cannot trick nature by just chucking them in a freezer for a minute or two, she believes. Frost falls from heaven, my mother says, as dew. Dew does not exist in a refrigerator. Now, there are other things you can cook in this book, and I do encourage you to take a look and see, but there, there is not one recipe in this book that doesn't have a story and the family somehow or other attached to it. Now, I don't know about you, but I think I'm going to go home and make me up a mess of greens. Maybe pan hot cornbread. Oh, my. I can't wait to get to my kitchen. Hope you find your way to yours. Now, next Friday. Oh, boy, do I have a treat for you. Since we're in the South, and this book is from the South, I've talked to a good friend of mine. It's a girl who... Uh, Mississippi. Her mama's from Louisiana, and she's going to tell us a story, something about cooking and growing up, and I heard tell she's going to give you a recipe or two. The name's Arlene Philkoff, and she's a good friend of mine. So I'm looking forward to next Friday. I hope to see you there, too. Till then, y'all take care. And eat something good over the weekend.